Route of the Dragon. Why should we be so amazed and honored because Dame Selyao wants to make a deal that would recognize me as First Lord? The truth is self-evident and shouldn't have to be bargained for. Prince Paul's remarks concerning Chancellor Liao's offer to recognize him as First Lord, in exchange for certain worlds, quoted from political memoirs, by Duke Gregory Simons, told O'Press New Avalon, 2999. After tending to these political matters for several years, Paul took to the battlefield once more in 2801. Letting yet another drive for Kentair's four, his strategy was not spectacular, yet the offensive gained House Davio on its victory. One major reason for the success of this campaign was the pressure that the Lirang Commonwealth was placing on the Draconese Combine, drawing away key DCMS forces from the Davion front. Another important factor was the leadership of Paul's uncle, Thomas Hall de Davion, whose grasp of tactical principles was as sound as Paul's understanding of strategy. Furthermore, the efforts of McKinnon's raiders on Kentairs kept the DCMS off guard, constantly forced to spend time and resources hunting down the guerrillas. After bitter fighting, the unhappy world of Kentairs, now a wasteland of corpses and ruins, was restored to Davion control. With the recovery of this planet, the Federated Sons began actively to reclaim ground lost to the Draconese Combine. Character generals reluctantly withdrew from several worlds deep in the Federated Suns because of the Davion forces on Kentes. By 2808, the Federated Suns had pushed back the Draconese Combine to the border between the Crucis and the Draconese Marches. With each victory, the Earths grew stronger and bolder. Prince Paul's military and political reforms were proving most effective, and even the most pessimistic citizens and politicians were smiling at the war news. A new confidence was in the air for House Davion, though some would later call it arrogance. It was at this moment that Paul Davion received a totally unexpected peace proposal from the Capellan Confederation. Sensing that peace would be easier to negotiate with the realm so much on the Up's wing, Chancellor Ilse Liao renounced her family's claim to the First Lordship. The proposal she sent Prince Paul promised to recognize the Davion claims to the First Lordship in exchange for control of the Chesterton region of the Federated Sons, most of which the Capellans had already wrested from the Uffs early in the war. Why Paul responded so coldly to this sincere peace proposal is still a matter of considerable debate. Some historians speculate that there may have been some hidden condition in the bargain to which the prince simply could not agree. Others think that Prince Paul suspected the Capellans of sending the assassin who had killed his father. Still others believe that Paul Davion and Dame Lisa had been secret lovers and that the Chancellor offered the peace proposal to patch up personal problems between them. Whatever the reason, Prince Paul responded to the proposal by ordering the 3rd and 5th Cruise Ice Lancers, who especially hated the Liao forces, to renew their efforts to seize the Capellan worlds of Olain Batar and Farwell. There were many nobles and high government officials who questioned Paul's rejection of peace with House Liao. Paul's answer was to send them or their family members into action on the frontiers. Meanwhile, things were not going well for the DCMS. For the average character soldier, indoctrinated with the idea of certain victory for the Draconese Combine, the years of slowly losing ground were disheartening. Added to this were the constant rumors about the Kentairs massacre, which troubled the sense of honor of many an average soldier. When news reached the Curita troops that the Earths was planning another massive offensive in 2809, a wave of fear spread through the DCMS. The offensive was to be a simultaneous thrust from either end of the Curita held territory. By surrounding many Curita-held worlds, the Davion generals hoped to trap the defending Curita units in a pincer-like grasp. As soon as the Dvans began their offensive, panic spread among the Draconese units. Many infantrymen simply ran for the nearest dropships, oblivious to their officers' commands. Mech, aerospace fighter, and tank units suddenly found themselves stripped of infantry support. They, 
too, offered only a token defense before heading for the dropships. By 2818, the Earths was fighting for Clovis, Dunevel II, and Leblanc, all planets quite near the original Davion Carrot border. Though the initial panic had run its course, many DCMS officers were committing seppuku for having failed in their duty. This wave of suicides devastated many units, as replacement officers often lacked substantial combat experience. The Federated Sun's forces stopped for a breather near the original character border, as the commanders realized that an invasion of the Draconese Combine would provide the enemy with an emotional rallying point. Moreover, they wished to avoid overextending themselves, considering the snarl caused by long supply lines and the need to continue to fight on the Capellan front. Time out. The First Succession War ended in 2821, more from sheer exhaustion than through the signing of any peace accords. None of the great houses was in a position to mount any new offensives, and so a semblance of peace graced the inner sphere for nearly a decade to follow. Like all the successor states, House Davion had suffered severely in this war. Its shipbuilding industries had been crippled by the funneling of key resources into the war effort and the devastation of many factory worlds. Numerous other planets had lost their production capacities because local water purification and fusion power facilities had been destroyed. Consequently, revenues for the Crown had dropped to less than a quarter of pre-war levels. Casualties of the First Succession War were estimated at over a billion, most of them civilian. This number did not even begin to account for the vast numbers who succumbed to famine, plague, exposure, and other disasters related to the collapse of technology on a hundred Federated Sons worlds. The Second Succession War. All dressed up with nowhere to go. Regimental slogan for the 102nd Avalon Mixed Weapons Unit. An uneasy peace. Prince Paul used the time of relative peace in the same manner as his fellow successor state warlords. He spurred his people to rebuild the military and to put the realm's scientific, technical, and economic resources back into a semblance of order. All the while, Paul continued to extend his personal control over many aspects of the Federated Sons government, mainly through the use of deputies appointed from the ranks of his own family. Of particular importance were his uncle, Thomas Hall de Davion, Peter Davion, the Prince's brother, and Lord William Stuart, Paul's brother-in-law. Paul de Davion was appointed Field Marshal in 2825, and was Paul's major link to the army. Lord William Stuart, on the other hand, was a particularly canny politician. Whenever the Prince had to be absent from New Avalon, Stuart carried on Paul's work in the court on New Avalon. As for brother Peter, appointed Duke of New Aberdeen in 2814, Paul employed him in a variety of ways, but particularly as a military leader. With such a large and diverse family to supply officials, Paul found it easy to maintain a Davion presence in every crucial area of his far-flung realm. Although other Davion leaders had followed this same practice, Paul was the first to demonstrate just how systematic this network could become. Critics grumbled that a man could not take a step without tripping over a Davion. Freed from many less important duties, Prince Paul turned his energies to preparations for the next war, which he and the other Leddingdons were sure would come. In public, however, the Dvons praised the peace and claimed that a Davion first lord would make it last for a thousand years. This facade reassured a people who had endured too much to contemplate yet another ordeal so soon. Most of the non-military build-ups during this period of uneasy peace were directed toward worlds that had suffered most in the fighting, whether from battle damage or because their vital supplies had been threatened. The government sent major convoys of transports to these worlds. These convoys were dubbed, Red Cross Wagon Trains, for the bright red cross on the sides of the jump ships and drop ships participating in the relief effort. Also at this time, the Davion government participated in secret talks with the Capellans to win the release of the thousands of captured of soldiers. 
It would have been no use attempting to negotiate with the Curitans for their dictum on Norium would not allow for the exchange of prisoners. Prince Davion handpicked the negotiators to handle these delicate and often dangerous discussions. Many who served the prince so well in this capacity later became important members of the newly created Mia negotiations with the Capellan Confederation were surprisingly difficult and treacherous. The Confederation had not forgotten Prince Davion's violent reply to Chancellor Elisa Liao's peace initiative, and they were not about to return any of Prince Paul's soldiers without making him pay dearly. A war crimes court put all the captured Davion officers on trial filling every day's record with gory testimony about the crimes of the accused. The news media of both House Liao and House Davion covered this sensational trial. All the defendants were found guilty and condemned to death. Chancellor Li Liao, meanwhile, was secretly informing Prince Paul that the accused were available for a price a very high price. At first, Paul backed at the terms but he changed his mind soon after the brutal Christmas Day execution of 20 F's officers, including a marshal and two generals. The ransom, which included tons of precious metals and minerals, paid not only for the lives of Davion officers, but for enlisted soldiers as well. So large was the ransom that it took two jump ships of booty-laden dropships to carry it. Paul Davion no doubt cursed in the day he had so callously rejected Chancellor Ilse's overture. War heats up. In 2825, the Draconese Combine launched what came to be called, chain gang missions, to prevent the reconstruction efforts on border worlds of both the Federated Sons and the Lurang Commonwealth. Disgraced officers, convicts, unproductives, Antisocial misfits were recruited for these missions with promises of citizenship and wealth. After only the barest Macquarie training, they were then assigned mechs that were one step from the wrecking yard. The various lances and companies of these ersatz Macquarie's amounted to a little over three regiments. Once a chain gang mission arrived at its target planet, the DCMS dropships and jump ships simply left them there. The members of the chain gangs did not know that the ships would never return for survivors until it was too late. On the battlefield, many chain gangs simply surrendered, hoping the enemy would treat them mercifully. Others fought bravely, but were easily cut down. Then, there were those few that fought far beyond their abilities, sowing damage and panic because planetary defenders interpreted their tenacity as an attack by frontline units. Largely through the efforts of these foolishly brave victims of the Draconese Combine, the reconstruction efforts of both the Federated Sons and the Lurang Commonwealth were thrown into disarray. Just as there was no official end to the First Succession War, there was no official beginning to the Second. For House Davion, the skirmishing on both its borders had become so heavy that by 2828, all-out war was the only logical next step. Prince Paul and his Fs were again eyeing the Liao frontier, especially the world so dear to the Capellans around Chesterton. Meanwhile, the Draconese Combine seemed to have turned its attention mainly to actions on the Loran front, taking some of the pressure off House Davion. Most of the Fs marshals considered this reason enough to mount a major effort against the Capellans, advising Prince Paul to seize the opportunity before the dragon once more turned its eyes their way. What they did not know was that Chancellor Ilse Liao was about to launch her own offensive against House Davion to keep the Fs on the defensive and out of the Confederation. The main target of her thrust was the planet Orbisonia, a major staging area of the Earths and home to the 2nd City Hussars and the 14th Avalon Hussars, both mech regiments. Chancellor Lisa Liao personally led her force of over a hundred heavy mechs and lesser regiments against Orbisonia, only to discover that the outmatched Davion defenders were still too mobile for the Liao forces to be able to administer the knockout punch. On the third day of battle, the arrival of Davion's assault guards from the Royal Brigade sealed the fate of the Capellan effort. While fighting a rearguard action to help her troops withdraw from the planet, Chancellor Ilsa was killed. The Earths was elated over this victory, 
which also vindicated Prince Paul's decision to concentrate his attentions against the Capellans. LN early 2829, the Prince moved his field headquarters to New Certis to begin a full-scale campaign against the Confederation. One of his first acts was to appoint Colonel Damien Hesk, a hero of the Davion stand against the raiders on Demeter, as the new Duke of New Certis. The Fiatum of the Certis March was invested with all of the powers previously enjoyed by the Princes of the Capellan March, and would remain in the hands of the Colonel's descendants all the way down to the present day. The Duke was instructed to raise additional forces from his new domain to swell the ranks of the sizable contingent that Paul had brought with him to New Certis. By 2830, the Capellan campaign was in full swing while the Draconis Combine had launched a new offensive against the Lyrans. It is here, in the latter months of the year, that most historians date the start of the Second Succession War. General Mochaika. I do my duty. No more, no less. Why? Is there anything more to a soldier's life? From official transcripts of the Mi interrogation of General Shoskab Mochaika, 2830. In 2830, contrary to expectation, the Draconis Combine launched a series of major raids against Davion border worlds. Some attacks were aimed at border planets such as Lucerne, Franklin, and Sakara v. More ambitious efforts were aimed at worlds deeper into the Federation interior. Though the Draconese military did not know it, the Earths had been preparing for the invasion for some time, having broken the DCMS battle code for the operation. General Shoskab Mochaiko was the character commanding officer for the raids against Lucerne and Franklin. He was a respected officer with 30 years of service and an almost religious devotion to the characters and the warrior's code of honor. Though his battlefield performance was as dull and unimaginative as any typical character officer, he had won a reputation among the Earths as a clean and honest fighter. The talent sergeant and the prostitute. Among those criminals, disgraced officers and so-called deviants, who were volunteered into the chain gang missions of 2825 were talent sergeant Joe Stuelogson and Katrina Reben. Stuart Orgson was a member of the Unproductive Regiment, a draconian euphemism for those imprisoned in a DCMS stockade. He had landed there as one of many troopers who found themselves unable to carry out the extermination order that created the infamous Kentares massacre. Katrina Rebum was an unproductive who had answered when officials had come to her new Samarkand village calling for true believers in the character way. Whether or not she was T-hat believer Katarina had spent most of her 28 years as a prostitute in a DCMS brothel. Katarina and Jewel were thrown together on a chain gang mission bound for the Davion world of Udabai. During the voyage, the guards allowed their charges to behave as they wished during their final hours of life. From the many physical couplings among the doomed men and women came a bond of true love between the talent sergeant and the prostitute. The raid against Dudibai failed before it began. The two lances of patched and barely operating chain gang mechs soon became scattered, and it was not long before Earth's forces began to hunt them down one by one. Talon Sergeant Stuart Orgson became trapped in a desperate cat-and-mouse game with two of Smecks while he searched desperately for Katrina Reben. This went on for two hours, until he finally came upon his love in her stinger, cornered by a Davion marauder. Throwing himself between Reben and the Davion mech, Stuart Orgson took the PPC fire meant for Reben's mech. The Davion soldiers who witnessed this act were moved by Stuart Orgson's heroism and by Katrina's explanation of why he had risked his life. The soldiers brought the story to their superiors, who allowed both the media and the prince to get wind of it. When Paul Davion learned that Stuart Orgson had resisted participation in the Kentares massacre, he immediately granted the lovers citizenship in the Federated Sons. Joe Stuart Orgson and Katrina Reben went on to serve in the Earths and later formed their own mercenary unit, which they named the Everfree. The exploits of this unit, whose symbol was the broken chain, 
become a popular part of the legend and lore of Davion culture. From True Tales and Popular Stories, by Father Ryan Raman, Unfinished Book Press New Avalon, 3010. While coordinating the attacks on the two Davion worlds, the General was dismayed to learn that both planets were crawling with more F's troops than expected. As additional reports came in, the General understood that news of the invasion had leaked somehow and that he was now in danger of losing all his units. He gave the order to retreat. The coordinator himself must approve all orders to row, retreat off-world, which could create more than a bit of trouble for character units in the field. On a number of occasions the coordinator's permission to retreat reached his men just a little too late to save anyone. To retreat without permission was a severe breach of honor, usually punishable by the deaths of the commanding officer, his staff, and a percentage of all troops that retreated. Many a character commander has gone ahead anyway, pulling his troops soft world, all the while praying that the coordinator's permission would arrive before the last soldier had retreated. The subordinate whom General Mochaika had dispatched with the request to retreat had failed to deliver it. It was not until the general's dropships had rendezvoused with their jump ships that he and his men discovered that they had participated in an illegal retreat that would now doom many of them to death. General Mochaika had received the news in proper stoic fashion, but decided to lead his three mech regiments and one tank regiment deeper into the Federated Sons instead of reporting back to Lutian. The target of this wayward band of soldiers was Dahar IV. Dahar was one of those few fortunate worlds that had not suffered from the First War, even though it had been occupied. Because of Dahar's many deposits of metals and heavy industry, the 23rd Avalon Hussars was stationed there, along with numerous lesser regiments. When General Mochaika's force appeared above Dahar, the Davion forces immediately scattered to their heavily prepared defensive positions to wait for the character dropships and fighters to come screaming in. Instead, they watched in amazement as the character dropships slowly approached, broadcasting a desire for negotiations. Many were suspicious of General Mochaika's intentions, but the Mi understood from its monitoring of character transmissions that something had gone wrong for the General. They assured the IFS commanders that if Mochaika allowed himself to be taken into IFS custody, his intentions were probably sincere. After landing on Dahar with only a regiment of mechs, General Mochaika and his staff did indeed allow themselves to be taken. While the Mi was interrogating the general, the IFS commander ordered his troops to stand down from their positions. At this signal, the other two Karatomek regiments left their orbiting dropships and caught the IFS defenders off guard. Soon, all the major cities on Dahar were aflame, while Karatomeks roved the countryside looking for targets. When Davion officers berated Mochaika for his treachery, the general smiled and said that his troops were only following their orders. He explained that an action such as this would remove the stain of illegal retreat from their honor. His unit might now even be able to return to the Draconis Combine, assuming that they escaped the Federated Sons. With that, Mochaika pulled out a small poison capsule hidden in the cuff of his uniform and swallowed it. When coordinator Jinjiro Karita heard of General Mochaika's actions, he gave the order that would allow General Mochaika's surviving troops to return honorably to the Draconis Combine. Battles for Tykonov. A nice place if you're a badger or a glutton for punishment. Remarks by a Davion mech officer during the Holland News show, The Son of Truth, 12 August 2832. With the recent flurry of character border raids, Prince Paul and many of his marshals were concerned that the Draconis Combine was turning its sights again on the Federated Sons. When several more tense months passed with only a few minor skirmishes, the IFS decided House Carita was not its main threat at the moment. By 2832, when all became quiet on the Draconis front, the Dvans designed an offensive against the Capellant world of Tykonov, yet another prefecture capital of the Confederation. Led by the flamboyant General Auer, Howler, Greer, the 2nd City Hussars Regimental Combat Team spearheaded the attack. 
considered a throwback to the cowboys of the American West, how Greer led his mobile and well-trained mechs through the desert badlands of Tykonov. Urging the Hussars to attack again and again, his almost maniacal energy shattered every organized attempt to stop him. The Howler's efforts came to an end outside the High Kremlin, the Kapellan's stronghold on Tykonov. A better mobile commander than Siege Master, the general found that he could not crack the Duggan defenders there. After six months of staring up at the whales of the Kapellan fortifications, Howler Greer was forced to take his troops off world when a Kapellan relief force threatened to cut him off from his jump ships. The next year, However, Greer was back on Tykonov with heavier weapons and Prince Paul's threat that he would assign the general to slinging hash in an officer's mess if he did not bring Tykonov under the Federated Sunburst. In a second, more successful effort, Howler managed to seize the majority of the planet, including the High Kremlin, during the second month of the campaign. What Howler failed to do, however, was to secure his supplies. A special Capellan strike force composed of Capellan Hussars fighters and light mechs entered the Tykonov system, striking directly at the city Hussars supply depots, with devastating results. Before the city Hussars could react to this new threat, Howler learned that the rest of the Capellan Hussars, including numerous assault mechs, were also on their way to Tykonov. At this blow to his cowboy pride, the general was forced to admit failure because he no longer had the supplies to fight the heavier mechs. Prince Paul made good his threat. General Greer served food at an officer's mess on New Certis for one year. Still determined to win Tykonov, Prince Paul decided to try again in 2834. This third attempt would use the 3rd Meb Light Cavalry Regimental Combat Team, commanded by General Jessica Basna. The plan was for her swift forces to cease and hold Tykonov's major continent long enough for another RLCT from the Royal Brigade of Guards to arrive and help take the rest of the planet. General Basma and her troops held up their end of the operation quite well, maneuvering with her slower enemy so that the key cities fell into her hands. Now the regiments of the Deleb Light Cavalry awaited the relief forces. They would never come. Just as the 2nd Royal Davion Guards RCT was to leave for Tykonov, coordinator Jinjiro Karita launched a raid against the guards' home world of Sunilak. The unexpected raid caught many of the guards' units in their grounded, defenseless dropships. Their losses were high, and by the time the 2nd RCT had fought off the Karita raiders, there was no hope of relieving the Deleb Light Cavalry on Tykonov. General Jessica Basna was forced to leave Tykonov to the Capellans. Paul's last years. Of course, I'm sick of all this fighting, but if I claim that I'm not going to fight anymore because I'm tired and worn out, what would stop my subjects from doing the same? It would be great if everyone on all sides could say that he, they were sick and tired of the war and were going to quit, but I doubt if Coordinator Karata or Chancellor Liao will call the war on account of exhaustion. Prince Paul Davion, 2842. The Tykonov campaign was a puzzle for many in the IFs. Though they understood the importance of attempting to take a capital world, the Davion armies could just as easily have bypassed Tykonov and continued the offensive elsewhere. Because of Prince Paul's seeming obsession with that planet, however, the IFs effort against the Capellans stalled. Some of the credit for the blunted effort must go to the Capellans, of course, who had finally given up their reliance on mass artillery attacks in favor of a swifter, more flexible tactical doctrine. Strategically, the Liao military had been reorganized with new area garrisons providing a better defensive response to Davion attacks. Another reason that the offensive against the Capellans bogged down was that Prince Paul was spending more time in the regional command headquarters on New Certis than on the battlefield in the late 2830s. It almost seemed that he had lost interest in the Capellan front. What was occupying the Prince's mind was the possibility of an offensive against House Carrota. The more reports that Paul read from his field marshals on the Draconis front, 
the more he believed that the arm of the dragon was vulnerable. What he needed was a diversion that would allow him to move the necessary forces from the Capellan front to the Draconis front without attracting the enemy's attention. Though he racked his brain for a solution, it was the DCMS that finally supplied Paul with his diversion. In July 2840, the Arm of the Dragon launched a fierce raid against Robinson in an effort to freeze Davion reinforcements away from a contested area of the front. At the same time, the action on three other worlds, Tancredi, Anguilla and Sturges, suddenly heated up. Taking advantage of the situation, reinforcements and reserves from the Capellan front were soon streaming toward the Draconis front. With considerable glee, Prince Paul planned to trick the Draconis Combine in much the same way that it had tricked the Federated Sons at the start of the First Succession War. In late 2841, Davion had assembled enough troops to launch a two-pronged offensive. One spearhead would strike at the worlds known as the Liao Seam, the border between the two realms near Terra. The targets were Maulery's world, Mara, New Roads 3, and Ozawa. The other half of the offensive aimed at the other end of the Draconis front, bypassing strongly held worlds and sizing planets deeper into the Draconis combine, such as Bryceland and Neles. By February, Prince Paul's offensive was succeeding. Though the Kalita defenders were not the easily demoralized soldiers of the end of the First War, they could not cope with the strong and flexible attacks of the Earth's forces. Mara and Bryceland fell within three months of the opening of the offensive. The success of this drive suddenly ground to a halt in July 2842, when unexpected news reached the front. Prince Paul was dead. Overtures of peace. No. You misunderstanding what I said again. I do not think our prince is a lesser man for actively pursuing his dream of peace. I think he is just a foolish one for not realizing that this is neither the time nor the place. Count Chalovhesk, during the FNS news program, Federation News and Review, 8 September 2843. Prince Paul Davion died during the night of 4 July 2842. While poring over computer reports on his latest offensive, he had been stricken with a heart attack. Early the next morning, his aides found him slumped over the computer planning board. The realm grieved, not only because he was an admired leader and fearless defender of the realm, but because the people considered him the last of the Star League Vans. Though Paul Davion was born about the time of the League's collapse, he was the last prince whose actions and attitudes spoke of the better times of the Star League. After Prince Davion's ornate and solemn funeral procession passed down the grand avenues of Avalon City, the reins of power passed smoothly to his son Michael. It did not take long before most people realized that Michael was the exact opposite of his father. Where Prince Paul had been obsessed with consolidating political, economic, and military power, Michael was more interested in salvaging everything that remained of pre-war culture. Following his cue, a wave of nostalgia swept the Federated Sons, generating a mania for preserving any artifact of Star League vintage. Many grumbled at the cost and expense of these salvaging efforts but the effort would lay the foundations of information upon which Hans Davion would one day build his institute for retrieving mankind's lost sciences and technology. Another significant difference between Prince Michael and his father was that of temperament. While Paul was a brilliant general who left most administrative matters to others, Michael would excel as a politician and a diplomat. Like any Davion, Michael had dutifully trained as a Macquarie, serving as a major in the earths, but he never displayed much interest or flair for war. This was a continual source of irritation, even sadness, for his father. The biggest difference between Michael and Paul Davion, however, was that the son was far more interested in peace than war. At the root of most of the new prince's policies was the firm belief that peace was attainable, but only if the right leader came along to see to it. From the year of his investiture in 2843,
Prince Michael spent a decade making peace overtures to the Capellan Confederation and the Draconis Combine. As his desire for truce became more passionate, Paul's peace offerings became all the more extravagant. Beginning with offers of ceasefire on certain war-ravaged worlds, the prince had soon escalated to offering the Leos and the Caritas entire worlds in exchange for their recognition of his claim on the First Lordship. The details of these peace proposals were never made public, but enough leaked out to throw the Federated Sons into turmoil throughout the first decade of Prince Michael's reign. Public opinion was dead set against any peace that would mean the loss of native soil. The nobility was also incensed at the possibility of losing their lands to a neighboring realm, and many campaigned bitterly against the idea. Not surprisingly, there were three attempts on Prince Michael's life during this time. Despite the threats and public disapproval, Prince Michael persevered. The Capellans and the Culletans were equally firm in rejecting all his initiatives. True to their own code of honor, the Combine saw offers of peace as a sign of weakness, and dismissed them as the blatherings of a defective Davion. The Capellan Confederation reacted in spite, remembering how crudely the Dvns had rejected Chancellor Ilse Liao's hopes for peace. Law Reli Liao, the current Chancellor, continued to ignore Michael's messages, though it certainly would have been to her advantage to see the Davion front cool down. The noble one. Peter Davion, Paul's brother and Michael's uncle, was the successor to Field Marshal Thomas Hall de Davion, a major military figure in Paul's reign. After sustaining severe injuries in the Third Tychonov campaign, Hall de Davion had been confined to a hospital for the rest of his life. Though his last seven years were spent in almost crippling pain, the loyal field marshal continued to serve the Federated Sons by transmitting his counsel via computer link to the new Certis Regional Headquarters. He died only a year before Paul, his friend and his prince. Soon after Michael Davion came to power, he elevated Peter Davion to the rank of Prime Marshal, a position created to allow military commander to stand in for a prince unable or unwilling, as was Michael, to participate in the war effort. As the Prime Marshal, Peter took responsibility for continuing the IFS offensive against the Draconese Combine started in 2840. This proved more difficult than he expected because Prince Michael's policies of peace had angered so many officers in the IFS. The mech officers, in particular, were enraged at the idea of giving up worlds for which so many brave soldiers had already given their lives. In 2846, a cabal of officers approached the 54-year-old Peter, offering to bring the bulk of the army to his banner if he would unseat the peace-lover Michael. Duke Peter Davion proved himself that rarity in politics an honorable man. With great dignity, he refused the request of these officers and warned them that he would have to call them up on charges of treason if anyone ever breathed such a suggestion in his presence again. Peter Davion remained unreservedly loyal to his nephew, and continued to serve the family in various capacities to the age of 91. Tishomingo in 2849, the Federated Sons was well pleased with its efforts against its enemies. On the Capellan front, the IFS was pounding the Capellan armed forces, with reports of the seizure of one Liao world after another coming in. With the capture of four planets from the characters, the Draconese front offensive was also starting to bear fruit. Even Prince Michael was impressed with the abilities of his IFS. Tishomingo an agricultural world occupied by the Caritans, was currently a major focus of the IFS. Besides being an important food resource, this planet was also rich in fresh water supplies. Because the Davion worlds in the same general vicinity were also water poor due to ravages of their purification facilities, Tishomingo's reliable water resources made it a tempting target. Though Tishomingo had originally been a Davion world, the Earths could not expect much help from the civilian population. Consistent with their policies on conquered worlds, the Caritans obtained the loyalty of the population either through retraining, through 
restocking it with more sympathetic citizens from other worlds, and by being sure that the pressure of the RISF internal security forces, agents kept the rest in line. Coordinator Yoguchi Karata had shrewdly foreseen that De Shamingo would be the Dvan's next target and had ordered in his 4th Sword of Light Mech Regiment to reinforce the planet's defenses. Those units strengthened the well-trained members of the planet's militia units along with three regiments of armor and three more of infantry. Leading the planet's defense would be Coordinator Yoguchi himself. He was livid at House Davion's recent military successes, and felt personally dishonored by the worlds the Combine had lost. Despite his advanced planning and strong defensive position, Yoguchi Karata did not realize how much the Ofs coveted to Shamingo. Some 20 Davion regiments, including four mech regiments, attacked to Shamingo, and the coordinator soon found his defenses outgunned. After Davion Marauders overran his headquarters, he was forced to flee into the surrounding forests. The planet soon fell to the superior numbers of Davion soldiers, and the remaining Karata regiments retreated off-world. Believing that his grasp on Tishamingo was firm, Prime Marshal Peter Davion dispatched all but a single mech regiment to other hot spots on the front. He would certainly not have done so had he known his men had nearly killed Coordinator Yoguchi and that the leader was still alive somewhere on the planet. Even the Curritans did not know that Yoguchi had survived. Alive and well, he was secretly organizing the people of Dishamingo into a fanatic level of resistance. Before long, the Davion regiment actually found itself under siege, with the entire garrison demoralized by the guerrilla campaign. The Davion commanders did not doubt that these were civilian efforts, but the skill behind them had the IFS officers both puzzled and worried. They still did not know that Yoguchi was orchestrating the offensive from his forest hideout, using peasant runners to carry his commands throughout the planet. While out on patrol one day, a Davion unit finally spotted and recognized the coordinator. The entire garrison went on alert almost instantly, with orders to spare no effort to capture the leader of the Draconese Combine. With the people on his side, Yoguchi was spirited away into the city of Urado. Still under the coordinator's direction, the people of Urado rose up and killed the Davion presence in their city. Then they set about turning their city into an impromptu fortress. The Davion troops failed miserably in the first attempt to enter the barricaded city, and it would take an entire week before they were able to assemble the battalion of mechs needed for the assault. Though brave, the citizens of Urado could not hold out against Prime Marshal Peter Davion. His determination to capture Yoguchi was as fierce as the people's desire to protect him. Led by the Prime Marshal, the F's units did finally take the city, but it took a week of fighting against her desperate guerrilla defense. Davion had still not yet located Yoguchi when he learned that a major Kurita force had landed on the planet. The Prime Marshal was forced to retreat off-world temporarily while waiting for reinforcements, and this cheated him of the prize of Urado. It was Rowena Kurita, the coordinator's younger sister, who had saved Yoguchi. Like the rest of the Combine, she had believed that Yoguchi died in the initial Davion onslaught on Tishamingo. When reports of the planet's well-organized terrorist activities reached her, she grew suspicious. Playing a hunch, Rowena, as the de facto ruler of the Draconese Combine, authorized a military operation to rescue the leader of the guerrilla struggle that had the local F's forces so terrorized. Her instinct was a true one, for coordinator Yoguchi was soon back in Lutian, safe and sound. He was not safe for long, however. During Yoguchi's first night home, his concubine, the mysterious Snowfire, quietly slit his throat with a special plasticine knife. Snowfire then committed suicide by swallowing poison. Comstar research has proved that the beautiful Snowfire was actually a Loran Intelligence Corps agent, planted in the Combine several years before. Editors note, the incredible fascination with this woman defies all explanation. Outside of the Draconese Combine, 
Artists from every corner of the inner sphere have used her as the subject of countless books, plays, paintings, ballads, and legends. Indeed, the power of her image has something of a religious tinge to it. Did Snowfire have help? Snowfire is one of the most enigmatic figures in the history of the inner sphere. All we know of this beautiful woman is that she was born in the Liran Commonwealth and trained by the Liran Intelligence Corps. She was planted in the Rezanag military district of the Draconese Combine, where she spent several years as a low-grade geisha secretly winning information from her clients. She won the eye of one of the coordinator's closest personal advisors, who bought her contract and took her to Lutian. There, she spent about a year and a half gathering information about the inner workings of the Imperial Palace, and attempting to attract the coordinator's eye. The story of her final heroic act has been told so often that it need not be repeated here. The question is, did the mysterious Snowfire have help from the Federated Sons? Declassified Myeo files have yielded references to an operative known only as, the Footman, who apparently was a member of the Imperial Palace staff during the time that Snowfire was present there. The identity of this Footman remains unknown. He might have been Talon Sergeant Donald Bairns, one of the Imperial Guards entrusted with the security of the Coordinator's chambers. Others speculate that the footman was Jessica Dindle, an Imperial messenger whose keys allowed her access throughout the Imperial Palace. It is still impossible to prove whether the footman, as either the guard or the messenger, knew of and aided Snowfire's mission. An agent in either role could have discovered the courtesan's true identity, either by noting the incompleteness of her security file or by breaking the code in the messages she sent to her mother. It is also possible that the footman could have helped Snowfire slip her knife past the Imperial Palace's security systems. It is interesting, even romantic, to think that Snowfire and the footman knew one another. Until new information comes to light, our speculations must end there. From, Speculations on Past Mysteries, by presenter, Van Fresterton, Comstar, Internal Bulletin No. 236185 PF, Archives, Terror, 3001. Miyogi's Marathon. One factor often overlooked in deciding whether to invade a world is the planet's emotional worth. What will happen to your enemy if you take the world? Will he shrug his shoulders and continue as before? Or, will he pull at his hair and gnash his teeth in anguish? Demoralize your enemy. Make him realize that you know what makes him happy and that you will do anything to take it away from him. From a single slice of the sword, strategy in a universe of dwindling resources, Miyogi Kurita, Imperial Press, 2847. The assassination of coordinator Yoguchi Karita sent ripples throughout the inner sphere. Though none of the other states knew that Snowfire had been a Loran agent, every house lord had good enough intelligence services to learn that the assassin had definitely been a foreign operative. The Karitans, of course, knew that the assassin had laid a house tiny regimental patch on the coordinator's dead body, and so they turned the full fury of their hate against the Lirans. To cover their shame that a lowly woman had felled their revered leader, the Karatans concocted a story of Yoguchi dying heroically in a struggle against a whole band of assassins. While the propagandists were saving the dragon's face, the new coordinator, Miyogi Karita, and his military commanders were plotting their revenge. In 2853, they turned their sights on the Lorang Commonwealth's huge battle in mech production facilities on Hesperus II. Located deep in the heart of the Commonwealth, these mech production facilities were the heart of the Lorang's ability to defend themselves, as well as the largest mech factories in the inner sphere. The huge battles that would swirl around that single rock would occupy the Draconese military for almost two years. Given the thoroughness of their strategy, it seems likely that the Curritans had begun their planning long before Snowfire slit their leader's throat. During this campaign, fighting on the Davion Curritan front tended to quiet down. 
with the arm of the dragon so focused against House Steiner, the Keratons contented themselves, for the most part, with the defensive stance on the Davion front. In the few outright strikes against Davion planets, the Keratons wished mainly to test the Davion defenses. In a rare act of military intervention, Prince Michael ordered his Prime Marshal to remain equally satisfied with containment for he preferred not to heat up the situation with new offensives of his own. One of the few decisive Davion Carita engagements fought during the period of the Dragon's campaign against Hesperus took place on Kendiz. The Davion people and their leaders had come to regard this planet as a doomed world that was no place for ordinary civilians and so it had never been repopulated after the massacre, of 2796-7. The Earths had instead coveted the planet into a major resupply point. Hoping to catch the Dvans off guard during the relative lull, the DCMS launched an invasion of Kentiers in 2854, planning to hold on to the world just long enough to make off with its supplies. Failing back on the tried and true strategy of harassment, Duke Peter, commanding the Earth's defenders, used raids and pinprick attacks to confuse and delay the invading character forces until Davion reinforcements arrived. Kentares would remain in Davion hands, but its price was not apparent until a few months later. The Dragon's Grand Plan Coordinator Miyogi, fresh from what he considered a partial victory against the Lyrans on Hesperus, decided that now was the right political moment to unleash the full power of the dragon against both realms. The amount of manpower and machines that Miyogi would need for this marathon offensive must have made the coordinator's generals grow pale. The DCMS High Command asked no questions, however, and soon the generals were setting into motion the desires of their coordinator. The double assault began in June 2854. The first five years of Miyogi's marathon met with considerable success, particularly on the Laran border, where he seized several planets. On the Davion front, the marathon offensive operated mainly to throw the Earths back onto the defensive. Duke Peter had been forced to set aside any plan to win new character planets in order to hold on to what he already had. The one world the Curritans managed to take was Robinson, the capital of the Draconis March. The planet had fallen to the Combine during the First Succession War and Davion had only managed to rest it back within the past 20 years. Though Robinson was not a particularly valuable world, Miyogi knew that capture of a capital world represented a special psychological victory over an enemy. The Dvans had mustered a total of 13 regiments, three of them mech units, to defend the planet. The Karita forces, led by four elite Sword of Light mech regiments soon gained the upper hand, however. Field Marshal Jerome Davion, a distant cousin of the Prince and commander of the Robinson defenders, called for reinforcements. Because so many of's regiments had been sent to reinforce Kentes, there were few troops near enough to aid the besieged planet. On Kentes, the DCMS forces were carrying out a series of almost suicidal invasion attempts to keep the Davion forces so tied up that they would be unable to spare any regiments to Robinson. Coordinator Miyogi's plan worked. After a crushing pivotal defeat at Brisson's crossroads, the Davion forces on Robinson were forced to retreat off-world in 2858. Loss of this planet hurt the morale of the Fs, just as the Combine generals had hoped. The Davion offensive against the Combine begun so many years before, in 2840, now sputtered to a complete halt. Politically, the loss of Robinson was the final defeat of Prince Michael's policies of appeasement, and even he had to face the realization that the inner sphere was just not ready for peace. Capellan Juggernaut. It was inevitable that the Combine's marathon offensive would eventually begin to suffer from severe shortages of supplies and parts. With full-scale campaigns operating on both its borders, the supply lines became much too long and entangled. This was affecting the fighting ability and the morale of Miyogi's troops. Instead of launching immediate counter-attacks, 
the Prime Marshal let most of his own troops rest, launching only occasional raids up and down the border to keep the Curitans guessing. Duke Peter d'Avion decided to concentrate his efforts against the Capellan Front. The fall of Chesterton some forty years earlier had begun an era of steady d'Avion gains against House Liao. Deprived of necessary resources, the Capellan armed forces were often forced to cut short their fighting, leaving many worlds to the Davion victors. This steady acquisition of worlds had fostered the false impression among the Davion public that the fighting on the Capellan border was easy pickings because the Capellan soldiers were weak. Nothing could have been further from the truth. The Capellan's weak point was not cowardice, but their inadequate military industry and inefficient supply system. Indeed, the Capellans were brave and tenacious fighters, as any Davion veteran would attest. At this moment of history, there were signs that this stubborn bravery had generated a warrior philosophy among the Liao infantrymen. In addition, Davion marshals believed that the Capellan Confederation had shrunk to its optimum defensive size. Its military was now strongly concentrated and capable of responding much more quickly than before. Concerned with these signs of stiffening resistance, Peter Davion himself took over leadership of the invasion of the Capellan world of Camel in 2860. According to reports, the Camel defenders were putting up a fierce resistance to save this resource edge planet and had managed to blunt the Davion drive. The Prime Marshal quickly learned just how spirited was the defense when an attack by a force of Capellan thrushes forced his dropship to crash land, seriously wounding him in the process. Because of the Liao air superiority, the defenders had effectively cut off the Davion troops from outside help. With the Prime Marshal clinging to life and unable to lead, all ten of his regiments on camel, including two mech units, would have to surrender. Fate stepped in to save both the Prime Marshal and his men on camel. Chancellor Aurelie Liao, architect of the Capellan defensive strategy, died in October 2860, a week before Peter Davion arrived on camel. Her son and successor, Dainma, was not a warrior and he viewed the heavy action on camera as a losing proposition. In one of the greatest blunders in recent military history, the new Chancellor foolishly ordered his forces to retreat off-world. Relieved that his favorite uncle had been saved, Prince Michael hoped to take advantage of the new Chancellor's weakness by authorizing a daring mech raid in 2861. It was one of the few times that the prince had taken an active role in military matters, but his timing was fortunate. The target of the Davion raid was St. Ives, the current residence of the Liao Chancellor. The regiment assigned to carry out the raid was the elite assault guards of the Royal Brigade, led by a brash young officer named Colonel Rebecca Davion, Prince Michael's second child. Famous for her unpredictable wildness, Rebecca had already been reprimanded twice and demoted once for disobeying an order to retreat. The St. Ives raid was the perfect mission for her. Having loaded aboard the FSS Resolve, the assault guards traveled virtually unnoticed to St. Ives by using uninhabited star systems and a series of false identity transponder codes to disguise their path and destination. When they arrived at St. Ives, the guards took the defenders so much by surprise that they made it to the planet's surface without losing a single mech. Once on the ground, Colonel Rebecca Davion split her force into two units. One engaged the Liao defenders, and the other moved deep into the heart of the planetary capital, toward the residential palace of Chancellor Dainma. The Liao defenders were reluctant to engage in a firefight for fear of damaging their city but they turned back the Davion forces in a stubborn defense of the Chancellor's palace. Fortunately, the Davion troops lost only two mechs in this daring raid, though both pilots were rescued. Before leaving St. Ives, Rebecca had her men put on a fearsome display of mechs for Chancellor Dainma, who was cowering in a reinforced bunker beneath the palace. The assault guards had so terrified Chancellor Dame on St. Ives that he sued for peace with the Federated Sons in early 2862. 
Realizing that the Chancellor would probably sign anything at this point, Prince Michael asked that the Capellans recognize all territorial gains the Dvans had made at their expense. The spineless Danemer agreed, signing over ownership of 16 worlds to the Federated Sons. News of the Capellan Davion peace did not sit well with the Draconese Combine, for they would not be able to stand long against an enemy who was no longer distracted by another front. Coordinator Miyogi's Grand Two-Front Offensive was finally showing signs of collapse because of exhaustion and because of the delays or inability to obtain supplies from the long, snarled supply lines. Late in 2862, after observing signs of increased Davion activity in the Robinson area, the generals of the DCMS came to coordinate to Miyogi to humbly ask that he call off the offensive before it turned into disaster. To their astonishment, the coordinator agreed. Soon, the fighting between the IFS and the DCMS tapered off, as both sides decided the time had come to resetire troops rather than attempt to gain extra ground. By 2864, no one would argue that the Second Succession War was over. If the outcome of the war were measured in territorial gains the Federated Sons was the definite winner, having taken so many planets from the Capellans. If the outcome were measured by which successor lord had advanced his claim to dominance over the others in the inner sphere, no one was victorious. If the outcome were measured by how many lives were lost and how the quality of life diminished for those who survived, then everyone lost that war.